must speak about Lacan and philosophy. <laughs> and it's not a, a simple question, in fact. <laughs> Concerning Lacan and philosophy, there are, I think, three striking points. First, the work of Lacan is full of precise references to practically all great classical philosophers. Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Kant, Hegel, Kierkegaard, and so on. It's not at all the case in the writings of Freud, for example. And it's really the first case where an analyst writes so many passages concerning classical philosophy. Two, which is contradictory to first, the explicit position of Lacan is not at all a philosophical one. On the contrary, Lacan uses the word anti-philosophy to describe the relationship between psychoanalysis and philosophy. And more generally, third point, more generally, Lacan affirms that all his original ideas come not at all from a philosophical and abstract background, but come from his practice, from this complex situation, the name of which is analytic cube. All that composes a strange situation. And to clarify this situation, we must first propose a description of the very nature of Lacanian experience as an experience related to thinking. Our point of departure will be the internal relationship between theory, practice, and thinking in the Lacanian vision of psychoanalysis. Why? Because certainly there is a psychoanalytic theory and there is a psychoanalytic practice, also called a clinic. But what directly concerns the philosopher is neither the theory nor the practice. What concerns the philosopher is knowing whether psychoanalysis is a thinking. If there is a sort of rivalry between Lacan and philosophy, it's not because they propose two different theories of the subject, for instance. And it's not because one is related to a clinical practice and the other to maybe a proposition concerning what is a true life. It's finally because Lacan proposes a very general framework for a new thinking of the human destiny. And we cannot clarify the ambiguities of Lacan concerning philosophy without a short explanation of what signifies the word thinking. Thinking, which is the English translation of Pensée, <laughs> but it's a difficult word, finally, and it is why I shall give a short explanation of my proper conception of what is in pensée, the thinking. 
I call thinking the non-dialectical or inseparable unity of a theory and a practice. For understanding this unity, the most singular case is that of science. For example, in physics, everyone knows there are theories, concepts, mathematical formula, and that there are also technical apparatuses and experiments. But physics as a thinking does not separate the two. A text of Galileo or Einstein circulates between concepts, mathematics, and experiments, and this circulation is the movement of a unique thinking. Politics is also a thinking. Take the great political thinkers, Robespierre, Saint-Just, Lenin, Che Guevara, and so on. <coughs> Not exactly Bush or Clinton. <laughs> which are something else. <coughs> In all the great political thinkers, we can find concepts, theory, even some philosophy. And you have the fundamental writings, like directives, or commands, or decisions. These writings, are those which act to concentrate the immanent relation between concepts and action. And you also have their treatment of concrete situations and the transformation of such situations. There also thinking circulates between theoretical hypotheses, statements, and singular situations. And this thinking, as politics, is a unique movement. It is why in the Marxist tradition, there is a common idea of uh, unity between theory and practice. But if you speak of a unity between theory and practice, you are speaking of something which is a thinking. Psychoanalysis also presents itself as a thinking. In the case of Lacan, one even finds everything that we found in physics. There are the fundamental theoretical concepts, like the subject, the ideal, the signifier, the name of the father, and so on. There are formalized, formalized writings, such as the... Alors, Matem, Matim? Matim. Matim. <coughs> such, such as the Matim for the fantasy, the formula of sexuation of the Borromean knight. And... There is a clinical experience, the cure, which has precise rules. There is even what one could call experimental apparatuses. For example, the protocol of the pass, invented by Lacan in 1967, which is designed to verify the existence of an analytic act. What is interesting for the philosopher is to compare psychoanalysis with other things like science or politics. Of course, the practices are completely different. 
but that does not prevent the thinkings from having some common characteristics. When is it that two thinkings have something in common? It is when the movement of thinking has the same structure. You know, the difference cannot be the difference of theories on one side or the difference of practices on the other side. Because the thinking is precisely the unique movement where theory and practice are inseparate. So if two thinking are different, it is by their movement, by this movement, this non-dialectical movement, and not only the parts, the composition of the movement itself. So two thinkings are something in common when the unity of the thinking we find in the unity of the thinking the same relation between the moment of writing and the moment of transformation or experience. So we say two thinkings are, have the same structure when the relation between the moment of writing and the moment of experience are the same structure. So writing can be different and experience too, but the relationship between the two has the same structure. So, for example, science and politics are completely different thinkings. It's a very interesting example. Why? Because in the science of physics, for example, the experiment is an artificial construction which must be repeatable. Repeatable? Repeatable. repeatable. <coughs> what makes mathematical writing correspond to experiments is precisely that when one repeats the experiment, it gives the same result. This identity is inscribed in a mathematical equation. In politics, it is completely different. A political situation is always singular and it is never repeated. Thus, political writings, directives, commands, are justified not by repetition, but because they inscribe in no way a repetition, but the unrepeatable itself. When the content of a political statement is a repetition, then it is rhetorical and empty. It is not a thinking. And in, the, in this way, one will distinguish between true political activists and politicians. True political activists <coughs> announce an unrepeatable possibility in a situation. On the other hand, the politician does nothing else but make speeches composed from the repetition of opinions. True political activists think singular situation and politicians do not think. 